all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Hallelujah. Remain standing as we read from Deuteronomy chapter 29, <clears throat> 10 through 13, 17 and 18, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, and then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. Today, you are standing, all of you, before Yehovah your God, your heads, your tribes, your leaders, your officers, all the men of Israel, along with your little ones, your wives, your foreigners here with you in the camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. The purpose is that you should enter into the covenant of Yehovah your God and into his oath which Yehovah your God is making with you today so that he can establish you today for himself as a people and so that you will be, <coughs> so that you, so that for you he will be God. As he said to you and he has sworn to your ancestors to Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. So let there not be among you a man, a woman, a family, or a tribe whose heart turns away today from Yehovah our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Let there not be among you a root bearing such bitter poison and wormwood. If there is such a person, when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself secretly, saying to himself, I will be all right, even though I will stubbornly keep doing whatever I feel like doing, so that I, although dry, sinful, will be added to the watered righteous. Atem nitzabim chayom kulkem lefne yachova eloche yak. Rashe kem ship te kem ze ne kem. Vishod rai kem koish Israel. Tap kem mishe kem vereak asher ba kareb. Machane yak mechoteb et seyak et shoe me meyak. Elbraak bibrit yachova eloche yak. Ublato asher yachova eloche yak. Koret imaak hayom. Elmaan hakim. Ot ak hayom elam bahu hi hi laak alohim ka asher teper lak bako asher mishpa la batak Abraham Yitzak Yaakov vitri vitiru et shitsuhem ve et kileye et vaben kisef haza asher mahim penesh pakem ish o ish imish percha eshebet asher el bad bo for ne hayom mie yahova alohenu. Like el la bod et en elohe hakoyim ha hem pen yesh pakem shoresh pore rosh velana. Proverbs 6 16 through 19. There are six things Jehovah hates, seven which he detests a haunty look, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet swift and running to do evil, a false witness who lies with every breath. And him who sows strife among brothers. Shesh hena sane yahova, vishab vishabata obot nef sho, e naim ramot el sho, shaker vidaim shof koth dam naki, leb choresh mach shobot, ave ralayam maharoth la roots lora, u fiach kisbim et et shaker um shaleach medanim bain achim. Hebrews chapter 12, 17. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing, he was rejected. Indeed, even though he sought it with tears, his change of heart was to no avail. Halo ye datem ki nimas, achare king ka sheratza, la reshet et habraka, ki lo matza vacom ti shuba uf kidesh otan bid maut. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, that everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. You may be seated as you move closer, please. <coughs> Gather in closer. In fact, I might even mess up the camera. I'm moving closer myself. Hallelujah. He is good. Now, as we read these scriptures, you know that the first scripture, of course, in Deuteronomy 29, <coughs> it, it seems to be very harsh. This is not a harsh, you're a horrible congregation. I can't believe what you're doing. You need to repent. There are some things that we need to repent of, but it is more of a solution to some of our things that we are going through, a solution to some of the things that we are experiencing. You know, <coughs> Netzavim means that you are standing. Atim Netzavim means that you are standing firm. 
And so when we read the scripture, we realize that Yehovah is calling all of us to stand together. So this word, you know, when, when I ask you to come up a little bit closer, this word is symbolizing that you are coming to hear this word as a community. Not just individually, but as a community. Because this is a community word. We all know that the community affects the community. We all know that individually we affect the community. What you do affects me. What I do affects you. What the left side does affects the right side. What the right side does affects the left side. We got that. We understand that. Whether we apply it or not, that's different. But we certainly understand if we have a home, <coughs> that if someone is disruptive in a home, it disrupts the whole home. So this verse teaches us that our standing firm is conditional upon it being all of us standing together. If you don't get anything else, but I know you will, get this. In the end, the reason why he says forsake not the assembly is because the only strength we have is the strength together. Yes, I know we have the Ruach. Yes, I know that we have Yeshua. But you can't be the Lone Ranger. You can't be out there looking for your own. You have to understand we stand together. We stand strong. We have, <clears throat> and each of us have a part to play, and we also have our own potential to fulfill within the community. So the very fabric of our community has an effect on all of us, whether we are directly involved or whether we are not directly involved. And that's one of the things about being community. <clears throat> you come with your trash and your sin and your mess and your family's mess and your sin, and I stand before you with my mess and my family's mess and my family's sin, and you know what? None of us are scared. We just stand together. We stand together when we're doing good. We stand together when we're doing bad. We're standing together when you come and all you've got to give is a praise, and we'll stand together when all you've got to do is cry. We stand together. That's the strength of us. When you're weak, we lift up your hands. When I'm weak, you lift up my hands. When you're strong, you're looking for other hands to lift up. Right? And, and, and any given day, you know, Paul said, any given day, I would also fall. So grace be given to me. So today, if you're doing well, and today everything's intact, and today <clears throat> your family is doing great, then rejoice. Because tomorrow, it just might not be so. And you need that strength, and we need the strength of each other. There is no us or them. It's line of Judah. It's community, it's Kahila, <coughs> it's our gathering. So each person needs to be then intact in order for us to achieve our communal potential. Our potential can only reach the heights of the weakest one. So what do we need to do? Strengthen the weak one. We have to strengthen the weak one. And it doesn't mean that we put our foot on their neck. It doesn't mean that we, you know, point our fingers at them. It just means that when they're going through something, we get it because we've been there. And if we've never been there, then hold on, put your seatbelt on. You will because your chapter is not finished either, nor is your book. So as we read, you know, these verses and, and we start out with the atim, nitzvayim, <coughs> which means we standing firm together, we all must stand against something. And this something is what I want to focus on today because it's one of the greatest threats to the house. And I don't mean just our house, you know, I'm saying, oh, you have a secret. No, no, I'm talking about the house. I'm talking about the community as a whole. We have to understand something. So we read these few verses, and then we down farther we read a little bit, and, <coughs> excuse me, and Isaiah read them in Hebrew. And what it talks about is that we have to be careful because within the community, if we're not careful, there can arrive a root of bitterness. That's what we're going to talk about. If you sit there and say, I, I don't know what bitterness is, well... I don't know. To me, bitterness is something you fight almost on a daily basis sometimes. Somebody looked at me wrong. Somebody uh, said something wrong. Someone didn't look at me. Someone didn't say something. It's the way they shook their hand. It's the way they didn't shake their hand. It's the way they annoyed me. It's the way they, uh, uh, <coughs> come on. <coughs> we have to fight it all the time with our wives, with our husbands, with our children. Come on. Everything around us, our coworkers. Uh, going to, uh, uh, you know, work and someone runs you off. You better hope I never see you again on this 95. Bitterness is characterized in the scripture as a root. Let's first understand that. What does a root do? 
It undermines. It goes through. It grows and grows and grows and grows. And what does that root strengthen? The tree. And the tree of what? Bitterness. So bitterness is characterized in the scripture as a root, a deep growing reality, difficult to see. Hello. You know why it's difficult to see? Because we all know how to do this. Let's all do it. Some of you maybe have failed. (laughs) We all can do this, right? We all can fake it till we make it. And sometimes we fake it and never make it, but we're still faking it. And so this this root (coughs) is difficult to see. It's a growing reality, and it would have to then be dug out in order for it to die. Correct? But always bringing forth its destructive fruit. You don't see it, but it brings forth fruit. You You can't pinpoint it, but it brings forth fruit. Some of us have... Uh, unwillingly and also willingly have planted a tree of bitterness in our lives and it's been growing underneath the surface that we cannot even recognize the destructive fruit that's in our lives. The epistle of Hebrews (coughs) says it this way. Uh, We'll read it again in Hebrews chapter 12. Keep pursuing what? Shalom. With who? Now, it doesn't say with those that deserve your shalom or those that give you peace. It says, keep pursuing shalom with what? Everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a very powerful mouthful. See to it that no one misses out on God's grace that no what? Root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates many and that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as the firstborn for you know that afterwards when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing he was rejected indeed even though he sought it with tears his change of heart was to no avail. The power of the root of bitterness is that it can run underneath the surface and not be seen and yet produce fruit And then sometimes it can pop up and go back down. The only way that you can get rid of it is to dig it up. Seek holiness and pursue shalom. So in this Torah portion, this parasha in Deuteronomy 29, it says, So let there not be among you a, and then he breaks it down so no man blames the woman and no woman blames the man. And no single person blames the family and no family blames a single person. He breaks it down. So let there not be among you a what? A man, a woman, a family, a tribe whose heart turns away today from Jehovah our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Let there not be among you a (coughs) root bearing such what? Bitter poison and wormwood. If there is such a person, when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself secretly, saying to himself, and this is the danger of not knowing you have a root of bitterness, that when you are under, when, when I, if I'm preaching this word to you, you are so oblivious to what you have that you will say, I'm okay. And even though you will stubbornly keep doing whatever you feel like doing, you are actually dry, not watered. You are actually sinful, not righteous. So in both texts, the idea of a root and the bitterness specified by the apostolic writer is no doubt a reference to the poisonous fruit. A wormwood. Which is used as a metaphor by Moses. None of us would knowingly take poison. (coughs) It would be a foolish person to take poison if you knew it was there. Right? So we have this sure litmus test for poisonous fruit, and that is that it's bitter, right? And wormwood is apparently a leaf or seed that tastes bitter. Unless you have allowed yourself to um, become used to the bitter, you know what I'm saying? The bitter makes you spit it out. But once you become used to it, what do you just do? Just keep drinking it. So let's look at that root of bitterness, because the root of bitterness in each case is a person or persons within a community that is unwilling to submit to the rule of Yehoah and then causes the community to falter. What must we be? (coughs) 
an imperfect community, certainly. A community with faults and failures, definitely. A community that's struggling to be righteous, but yet at the same time fighting against those things that cause us to be unrighteous, yes. Where, where's the list? Do I need to sign my name? But here's the thing. We have to <coughs> at least try to say, or at least want to say, I want to follow him. Do I always do it? No. But I want to follow him. This, this proclamation of the apostolic writer is directed to the community as a whole. Look at Hebrews 12, 15, and 16. See to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root or bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates what? Many. And that no one is sexually immoral, godless like Esau, who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as a firstborn, <coughs> causes trouble to who? To many. Again, it would be great if what my life just affected me, but that's not true. Right. I tell people all the time because, uh, you know, in, in a driving school, I said, if if someone in your car is not wearing a seatbelt. And you say to them, you must wear a seatbelt and they say, no, I'm not wearing a seatbelt. It's on me. My life is on me. You have to say to them, no, your life is also on me, because if I'm going 80, going 70, the maximum speed is 70, if I'm going 70 and I have a wreck, and you do not have a seatbelt on, that means while the car is going 70, you are going 70, and when we wreck, you are picked up at 70 miles per hour and thrown around the car. Though I might be stationary, <coughs> you can kill me. So guess what? It's not about you. It's about everyone in this car. So wear a seatbelt or get out, just the way it is. All right? Either wear a seatbelt or get out. And I have a little video that shows that a, a car just to hit a little curb and he spun, 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 and he's picked up and thrown around the car. And if you were in the front seat, it would it would have broke their neck. If you were in the back seat, he would have <coughs> he would have uh, done great harm to those in the back. So we just have to understand it's just not you and your little life, and that it only affects you. And he says to us, a root of bitterness that that causes what trouble and contaminates what many. So here's Moses, and he's exhorting the nation as a whole. And he does that by calling the man, the woman, the family, the tribe, the children, all together. Why does he call them individually? Because you need to know <coughs> that not only is it a community thing, it's an individual thing. He could have just said, come, but he wanted you to know every man, come, every woman, come, every child, come. Everyone who chops the wood or everyone who does the water, come. No matter how menial your job is or how great your job is or what, what status you are in or who you can recognize in gender or position, you need to come because I'm talking to the community and that involves everyone. You can't slide in thinking God's not talking to you. You can't slide in today and thinking, oh, yeah, that's right, Pastor. Preach to sister. Preach to brother. No, <coughs> I'm preaching to you as well as I'm preaching to me. So Moses is exhorting those as a whole, and he warns us about those who would remain among them and having given themselves over to false worship, which would then infect the community as a whole with the spiritual disease of idolatry. Again, the root of bitterness is a person or persons who refuse to submit to the rule of Jehovah and rather go their own way. Deuteronomy 29. If there is such a person, when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself secretly, saying to himself, I will be all right, even though I will stubbornly keep doing whatever I feel like doing, so that I, although dry, will be added to the watered righteous. So you can sit here and have uh, be counted as part of this lively worship, lively praise, lively amen, hallelujah time, but actually you're dry. <coughs> you're in the middle of this great watered place, but actually you alone are dry. But Yehovah will not forgive him. That's strong words, people. Rather, the anger and jealousy of Yehovah will blaze up against that person. And every curse written in this book will be upon him. And Yehovah will blot out his name from under heaven. So serious is, you know, he said, if you, if you hurt a child or come against a child, better that you were just thrown into, you know, with a millstone around your neck. Because he... He understands community, and he, he wants us to know that you can affect community, and if you affect community, you affect my purpose, you affect my kingdom, and you will not affect my purpose or kingdom without a cost. 
because the bitterness is within the heart and then seems hidden from the community as a whole. <clears throat> the person who stubbornly refuses to submit to Jehovah's rule thinks he's secure and untouchable because we can sit here and no one has to know what's in our heart. That's the tricky part about community. Until it peaks its head. Have you ever had anything in your family? You thought everything was fine, everything was wonderful, and all of a sudden something peaks, and you're like, where'd that come from? You look like you were acting right. You look like you loved me. You look like you cared about me. You look like, and all this was looking like it. <coughs> but all of a sudden something peaks, and we think, oh, wow, what in the world? Guess what? It didn't just happen. It's been a root. It's been a root that's been laying underneath the ground. It's been a root that's been growing and growing and growing. And every once in a while, that root will pick up and it will destroy. It will, it will uh, contaminate. And then it goes back underneath the ground. And we have to be very careful because we can all sit here with our smiles and our praise and our worship and yet be someone who is not submitting to the rule of Jehovah. And here in Deuteronomy 29, we have this eternal consequence that's thrown into the mix because it would be one thing just to say God's going to slap me on my hand. It's another thing for him to say I will not forgive them and I will blot their name out of from under heaven. Jehovah promises to deal with that which is hidden. Remember what Yeshua said that which is uh, hidden will be seen, right? Well, in Deuteronomy 29, <coughs> 29. As you go down a little bit further, he says, things which are hidden belong to Jehovah our God. But the things that have been revealed belong to us and our children forever so that we can observe all the words of this Torah. So as I was reading this and studying this. Um, this very powerful revelation <coughs> was revealed. So let's look at it. Secret things. How many have secret things? Now again, I'm not asking you for, you know, we're not judging you, but, you know, you know, maybe things that you're fighting with, things that, you know, are running rampant in your brain. Uh, you just have some things that you're dealing with, but it's not vo vocal. It's no. Does anyone have secret things? Well, who takes care and who deals with the secret things? Listen, I can't try to figure out your secret things, nor do I want to, because, frankly, it would be very scary. <coughs> I can't try to figure out your secret sin. You know, why is this going on in my life? Why did that go in my life? Listen, sometimes it's because of disobedience that things are going on in your life. Sometimes it's because life is life and that's what happens. Sometimes it's the disobedience of somebody else and that's why you're experiencing it because you're attached to someone else, correct? Sometimes it's just what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Right? <coughs> so whatever the secret things are, Guess what? Yehovah knows them, and he will deal with them. I don't have to put my secret thing goggles on to try to figure out what's going on in your life, right? I have a hard enough time figuring out what's going on in my life and remain intact and straight, right? So the secret things belong to him, but the revealed things, according to the scripture, actually is a responsibility of the community, which means when something does come to light, then we have a responsibility to deal with it. That is our job, right? And Yehovah will deal with the community on the basis of how that community deals with the revealed sin within its midst, which means if we see it and no one says anything about it, then we also are in a, in a heap of trouble because that is no longer secret. It is open and we have to deal with it. We don't run from it. We, don't, we, we are not paralyzed by it. If you've come to Wednesday night, you realize in 2 Timothy we read and he went through that there are liars and, and uh, <coughs> I can't even, if we, I, don't, I, I think it's uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, one through something, and he goes through and he talks about all these uh, horrific lifestyles. And then when he goes through these lifestyles, what he says is they returned to them. They went back into the former life. And he said, this shouldn't have been. So, you know, we look at that and say, that's right, it shouldn't have been. But what we don't realize is that those are who we are. So when it talks about a liar returning back to a lion, that means a liar, that means we were liars. <coughs> we were not the cream of the crop. 
We are the wretched sinners that he called and, and loved and brought us out. And if we're not careful, we can return back to that former state. It's our job to maintain that we don't, which means that if you had some of those things in your former state, those are some of the things that you'll be dealing with all your life. So we don't shy away from them. <clears throat> I'm not shocked at your sin. Hello? I'm not shocked at your attitude. I'm not shocked at your thinking processes. You know why? Because you still have to fight your evil inclination. And though he's a miracle worker, come on. Some things you've got to work out and walk out. And if you're not willing to work it out and walk it out, then you're going to deal with that the rest of your life. But when things come to light, then sometimes as a community, we have to deal with it. But if it's secret things, I'm not looking for your secret things. I'll let you deal with it. But sometimes we just want to know. I just want to know. I want to know what's going on. Well, no, you don't need to know what's going on sometimes. Right? <clears throat> Moses warns the community that to tolerate a root of bitterness is to accept Jehovah's punishment upon the whole community. Because the poison will eventually <clears throat> poison all who become entangled in their bitter fruit. And you all know it's easy to pull people in. We know it because we're, we've been pulled in very easily our own self. So the question is, how are we to live out this teaching of getting rid of that bitter root? How are we to live this out? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is this harsh and stern language should warn us, first of all, to stay away from bitterness altogether. But we have to ask ourselves the question, even though we've talked about it a little bit, what exactly is bitterness? <coughs> we've all had it. We all still have it sometimes. Right? You could be good in one area and then bitter in another area. Right? But I don't want to be three-fourths good or three-fourths filled. I just need to say, God, let me, let me work on these things. And, you know, if I find that root, let me get rid of that root. Because chopping the tree down is not good enough because the root still maintains. I told you about that blue spruce in the back of my yard. I've, it's still living. <coughs> I've trimmed it. I've cut it. I've slaughtered it. And it laughs at me. Because in a week, there, there's another leaf. There's another branch. I'm thinking, oh, my. so I left it alone. I said, fine, you want to grow, grow. I don't care. <coughs> Every other plant the dog pees on, it dies. <laughs> he can pee forever on that blue spruce, and the blue spruce is like, thank you for the water. I appreciate that. I'm going to take pictures of it and show you. Y'all can, we'll have a field trip. We'll all go. Just look at the blue spruce. Maybe it's a miracle working tree. Maybe if you put your hand on it, then something will produce in your life. I don't know. It's true. I can't kill it to save my life. The reason is, is because I have not worked on a root. I just work on what is on the surface. <coughs> Listen, we've been born again 20 years, 30 years. We've been here 33 years. And here's the thing. We're still going through some of the same things, then with the same things, because we just keep on trimming the tree, and we have not yet gotten to the root. So what exactly is bitterness? Well, Paul includes it in the list of things which are to be put away in advance of forgiving others. Let's look. Get rid of what? All bitterness, rage, anger, violent assertiveness, slander, along with all spitefulness. How many are still in verse 31 sometimes? <laughs> How many can see yourself in verse 31? <coughs> I mean, you can pretend you don't, but come on. The reason why you can't pretend, uh, the reason why you pretend you don't is because you haven't looked underneath the surface. And then it says, and be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgive each other, just as in the Messiah, God has also forgiven you. How many will recognize verse 32 is harder than verse 31? 31 comes easy, 32 takes work, Right? But I want you to look at Ephesians 4.32 because it begins with the word and, and and indicates that it's bound together with verse 31, which means something. It means that the things listed in verse 31 <coughs> impede verse 32. You cannot walk in forgiveness unless you put away bitterness. 
You cannot walk in forgiveness, be tenderhearted, and be kind. Some of you are trying to figure out, why can't I be kind to people? Because you have one of those other things in verse 31 that's a root in your life, and you can never be kind. I try to be kind. I try to be nice. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work because you're still dealing with something, a root in 31. You cannot be kind and have bitterness. You cannot be kind and have rage. You cannot be kind and have anger. You cannot be kind and tenderhearted and have violent assertiveness. But this is just who I am. And God's been, yes, God has been patiently working with you. <clears throat> More patient than some of us. Right? But don't think his patience and mercy and grace is an approval or star or an A plus on your life. He's just been waiting because what you've sacrificed with your bitterness is your kindness. What you've sacrificed with your rage and your anger is your tender heartedness. Some of us have become very hard hearted. What we used to cry about, what we used to love, we don't do it. And we're trying to figure out maybe it's just the age. Maybe I'm just getting older. Maybe I'm just getting wiser. You're not getting wiser. You are getting older. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that you've allowed a root to continue to grow, and every once in a while it peaks up and comes out and causes destruction, not only in your life, but in the lives of other people. And even if it never peaks up, it's still affecting you as the tree. I find it hard, Pastor, to forgive people. Why? Go to verse 31. That's why it's hard. Because you cannot. You can come here and say, Pastor, pray for me for that. I might, I might give forgiveness to my, <coughs> to my family member, to my husband, to my wife, to my children, to my job, to whatever. I pray that I have forgiveness. And you might say, oh, Lord, give me forgiveness. And he's going to say, I'm trying to give you forgiveness. And you can get prayed for. And an oil, that would be really nice because then you can be a slippery forgiveness. But the thing is, is that you got to get rid of that stuff. And that stuff has been underneath your surface. And until you try to get rid of it, all the prayer time is for naught. Therefore, you must be <clears throat> a person who puts away those things that cannot cause forgiveness, tenderheartedness, and being kind. That's a healing salve that needs to be administered in your life and in your community. And let me tell you, when you've housed and been in community with people long enough, there's going to be some root things happening. Listen, we're not a mega church where we see every once in a while and we don't know what your life is. Come on, we all, most of us live, we can see each other. What's going on in D's house? <laughs> Gail, Pastor uh, Nell's home. Not that we're concerned with her nail or Pastor Kenny's home. It's just a natural thing. We're there. You go by the window. Nail's home. Next thing. Where's Pastor Kenny? Uh, I don't know, Gail. <laughs> I don't know where he is. Hold on. Let me see. Nope. Can't get a read. I can't get a read. <coughs> Why Nell leave so early? I don't know, no. I don't know, Gail. Why is she home so late? I don't know, Gail. We need to ask Malek, who keeps the watch on all the community. Where's Byron? I haven't seen Byron Kapoor. I don't know where Byron is. <laughs> right? <coughs> we've seen the good with us. We've seen the bad with us. We've seen the ugly with us. Right? We've been kind to one another. We've been mean to one another. We've encouraged one another. We said, get out of my face before I hurt you to one another. <laughs> we've been with us. We've been against us. Right? We've been at the altar praying, oh, sister, oh, brother. And then we've been at the altar saying, no, I'm done crying with you. <laughs> I am done, 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 done. <coughs> because that's what happens when you're in a community. And therefore, you have to be very careful that a root does not begin to grow. See, we, you don't care about the neighbor you don't see. You don't care about the neighbor you don't house with. You don't care about the neighbor that you don't church with, you, you know, the only thing I think of is, you know, why is the police down there? It, it, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> right? So I'm not going to have a root of bitterness about that or what's going on. What my root of bitterness that destroys me is those as a community that we allow, and he called every man, every woman, every child, everyone who chops wood, everyone who does water, and <coughs> let them know, do not let. He's not telling you, 
do, he, there is a way that he says don't go in the world, but he's more concerned at this time with the community. Don't let this contaminate within you because that takes out more people than what's happening out there. Bitterness is the result of a lack of forgiveness. Write that down even though you know it. It's a lack of forgiveness towards someone who has sinned against you. Did he say that <clears throat> when you got born again that people would never sin against you? No. And who are the people that are sinning against you? Those who know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's the ones that you expect to be kinder, more forgiving, more sensitive. And when that doesn't happen, <coughs> because guess what? Sometimes it doesn't happen. A root. So rather than forgiving in the very pattern of Yehovah, and what is the pattern of Yehovah? Messiah came and loved you in spite of yourself. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you step in and say, yeah, but those who know what, <coughs> <coughs> no. They, you don't think when he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that some of them didn't know what they were doing? What he's saying is, in the big scope and the view of everything, they're not getting it. And you know what? In the big view of our lives, we don't get it. We just don't get it. We're so very today. We're so very how it affects us today. We're so very what we can do. We don't see the big picture. Right. And sometimes what looks like they know it and they mean it. <coughs> it could be bad day. Not excusing anyone. Could be a bad day. Could be going through something. Could be they, you know, their filters down. They and they and they and maybe they're I don't know what people are going through. I don't know, you know, so you were smart with me. I don't know. Maybe maybe someone was just smart with you. Maybe you're going through something. Maybe you're not feeling well. I don't know. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Here's what they don't know. <clears throat> they might know what their behavior is, but they don't know how it's affecting me or affecting someone else. No, no, you're, yeah, I'm just kidding. No, no, you were teasing. I'm not, this whole sermon was not circled around you, Sharon. <clears throat> I was not adding to my sermon. Hold on, Sharon. <clears throat> what bitterness does, bitterness, okay, holds on to the offense and desires to see justice. How many have ever seen, I want God to bring, vengeance is mine, saith God. But when we say vengeance is mine, saith God, we are somehow holding on to his hand like we are part of that vengeance. But what did he say? Vengeance is who? <clears throat> his. You have no place for justice. God has not given you the power to have justice. He's not telling you that you can, you can get even or, or you can <clears throat> punish those. Oh, let me tell you, I'm not going to talk to you. That's going to punish you. Oh, I'm going to get even with you. you. That's not your place. That's not who you don't have any power. That's not your responsibility. Sometimes we think it is. You know, we, we kid about the tent peg and, you know, all those things. We read all those things, and, and I get all that. And, and, but, but, but let's get real with ourselves sometimes, right? And the reality is this. We want justice, and we try to give it our own selves. We want to get even. We try to, we try to do it with our own uh, beings. We try to have punishment come to people, and we do it in our own way. But all of those aspects of what your this is what Yehovah does, not what we do. He said, "Vengeance is mine. Justice will be mine. <clears throat> getting even, if there needs to be getting even, will be mine. Punishment is up to me, not you." Now, this does not mean that we forgo justice. You know, we just throw our hands, and say whatever, but. Neither also implies that forgiveness is only real if restoration with the offending party is realized. If I never have restoration with you, it doesn't mean that that restoration is dependent upon forgiveness. I can forgive without restoration. <clears throat> restoration requires not only forgiveness on, on the part of the one who has been sinned against, but also repentance on the one who has sinned. And sometimes both parties are not 
going to be at that place, but it doesn't stop you from exhibiting forgiveness, even if there's no restoration that's going to happen. And even if both parties genuinely forgive each other, it doesn't guarantee the relation will be restored. Back to where it was before the offense. Because sometimes, you know, if you've been bit before, <coughs> though you might still have a relationship, you're still now at least careful you don't get bit again. But it doesn't mean that I hold anything. I'm going to make sure that that root is not growing uh, underneath my Underneath my life. Listen, the ability to forgive someone does not depend upon that person repenting. You can forgive even if they never repent or they never ask you to be forgiven. You're just waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the day. When they finally realize <coughs> and come to me. Well, here's the thing. You have a root. Because if you're waiting you have a root. Because you waiting means I cannot release this till they come. Now you have now a root running underneath that cannot move. <coughs> you and bearing good fruit, it will only bear dangerous, poisonous fruit. And who does it really change, first of all? You. See, when God says forgive those that do something bad, he's not relinquishing what they did. He's trying to save you. That's how much he loves you. When he says, listen, vengeance is mine, he's trying to say, get your hand off. Let me, listen, let me carry this thing. Why you keep carrying it? Because when you carry it, it's destroying you. The, the wormwood, the poisonous fruit, it's destroying you. You can't look at people the same. You can't look at that person the same. You, <coughs> you have distrust, and, and, uh, and, and, and now you're not enjoying your salvation. Now you're, you know, you're, you're stuck, and you, you don't praise like you used to. You don't worship like you used to because that, that, that root is a constant reminder uh, of what's going on. You have bitterness, and, 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 and one simple thing can cause rage, and another thing can cause anger, and, and, and it's destroying you. He said, listen, I love you enough just let me take care of what i need to take care of let me be god and on my throne forgiveness means changing my perspective toward the one who has sinned against me <coughs> giving the offense up to Yehovah, and allowing him to discipline and deal with the offender i have it up here in his way in his timing we have one eye on God and one eye on when's justice coming. Because somehow we have this moment when justice comes, we're going to do a justice dance. <coughs> I knew it. I knew it. I'm vindicated. I'm vindicated. No, you're not. Because now you have spent 10 years wasting as a dry root sitting in a watered place. And how sad is that, to be dry in a water place? Do you, can you imagine the praise, the worship that's in this place, the word that's in this place, the, <coughs> the power that's in this place, and yet we're dry in the middle of water? Does it make sense? And listen, we, we, we've come to a time in our lives that we have to start making some sense. <laughs> and if the, there's a root that is underlining on my ground, <coughs> Instead of it continue, listen, we chop down a branch. We come, oh, Lord, I release this. I release it. I release it. We chop down a branch. Oh, Lord, I forgive them. I forgive them. We chop down a tree. Oh, but we never take care of that root. And then we walk away thinking everything is hunky-dory, but <coughs> sometimes it, it takes a little while for the manifestation of the root that's not dead to come out. Because we have one eye waiting. For the justice, the getting even, the punishment. Aha! Because we think that validates our love that God has for us. And we can't get why that immediate punishment to us, we think that God doesn't love us as much as they, he loves them. Because where is our punishment? Where, where is that getting even? You should be at my aid. You should come. And what he's trying to tell you is 
that's my stuff. Leave me alone. That's my timing my way because guess what? You put your hand on it, you'll ruin what I'm about ready to do, and you'll ruin what I've been setting up. Get your hands off of it. Forgiving simply means, I got these for slides for you. Forgiving simply means, read it with me, submitting to Yehoah's method of justice rather than trying to administer our own. You don't talk to me, I don't talk to you. That's how I administer justice. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. <coughs> you ignore me, <laughs> two can play at that game too. In fact, I'll ignore you more. In fact, if you come to talk to me, I will make you work for it. Oh, I didn't see you. Sorry, I didn't see you. Love you too. And it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we're trying to figure out, Pastor, I'm just praying. I don't, I don't, I don't have no <coughs> communication anymore. I try to praise and I can't praise anymore. It's, it's on you, Pastor. What's wrong with you? Has I have to leave, I have to leave, I have to leave. Why? You, gonna, you, you follow yourself, you, you go where you go. You're going to take your root. In fact, maybe, if, if, yes, take your root. Let me help you. I, uh, can I call you Uber? <laughs> Before that root, it starts contaminating many people. Oh, we want to administer on our own. We want it quick. We want it fast. And we want it displayed for people to see. Do you see what happens when you mess with the anointed one? <laughs> we always use that verse, don't touch God's anointed. Okay, come on, people. <laughs> uh, you know, that might be true, but are we really there enough to say you can't touch God's anointed like we, like we are uh, walking on water? Another slide. Here you go. It's about forgiveness. <coughs> Forgiving begins by submitting... To Yehovah and his way of handling things. Oh, I've been learning that. Gail and I have been learning that. Disruptions within the family, things happening. I'm, I, I, am, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I hit 60 because I'm becoming so free now I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, someone gives you a bigger shocker, you're like, oh, really? Okay. Anyway, I'm going to go get some chicken. <laughs> what do you think about that? I think nothing about it. I think nothing, 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 and I think nothing. You know why? Because you are in God's hands, not mine. See, it used to be in my hands, and I'd worry and get old, and then you have to cover up the oldness. You know what I'm saying? Oh, not anymore. Forgiveness begins by submitting to Yehovah. Just let me submit to Yehovah. <coughs> then whatever destruction seems to be happening... God is justice. God's a good and even God. God's a punishment God. And I'll just pray that God somehow intervenes and intercedes and does whatever. But I'm focusing on Yehovah. Do I pray for you? Certainly will. Do I encourage you? Certainly will. Do I <coughs> discipline you and tell you where you're wrong? Certainly will. Still got that on me. <laughs> but for it to plant a root in my life and destroy me. That ain't happening no more. If he commands me to forgive the person who has hurt me, then this is where I must start. That means I have to change my perspective toward the offending person. <laughs> Putting the matter into Yehovah's hands. And then be willing to deal with that person or persons with the tender heart of forgiveness. <coughs> Does it mean that you're okay with everything? No. Does it mean that they are now your housemate? No. 
Does it mean you just say, here's my keys, take my car, have my house? No. But I'm tenderhearted to your situation. <laughs> and I've given you over to Yehovah, and I am such relieved because you know what? I couldn't fix anything anyway. See, I think our frustration is we, we think we can fix it. We can't fix it. And then when we can't fix it, <coughs> what do we plant? Root of bitterness. Because what are we, who are we, who are we bitter about? Who, who's our father? See, we're bitter against the father. We don't realize that we, we shove it on someone else because we are saying to the father, my timing, not yours, my way, not yours. And when you don't do it in my timing and in my way, I'm mad at you. See, no one can stop you from praising him <coughs> unless you're mad at him. See, no one can stop you from coming to the house and studying the word and being hungry unless you're mad at him. And you are somehow holding out to you twist his arm, an arm enough and he sees that you're sad enough. You know, um, I'll just say this. My, when, you know, my children were growing up and the breaking up of the marriage and stuff like that, I have come to the understanding that I parented sometimes out of guilt, which means I try to make up and fix things that I could not make up or fix. <coughs> then what has happened is, is then you have a mess, right? At the end of the day, you have a mess. I was trying to create something and fix something that really what I should have done was handed it over to Yehovah and then just did what Yehovah wanted me to do. But you try to, right? Cover, fix, you try to make sure the justice or whatever. You're, you're just trying to do all those things. And then <coughs> you actually have created more destructive things than restoration things. My point is we, we, we've done that with God and, and we want God to parent us out of guilt and he won't. See, if I want something, I look at him with my sad eyes and say, remember how I was brought up? Remember what I went through? And we want him to say, oh, my name's I remember, sweetheart. Okay, here. <laughs> but he says, because he's a good father, he says, and? Remember, I'm the only prophet in the whole entire world. There's 5,000 sitting around over here. Elijah, get up underneath that juniper tree. <laughs> you know, you can almost see God. And Jezebel's got you underneath a tree. <laughs> the big bear woman got you underneath a tree. Because you think you're the only one. <laughs> yes, God, help me. He doesn't parent out of guilt. <coughs> we parent out of guilt. We give because we think, oh, no. We need to learn to parent out of Jehovah's standards only. Yeah, but you didn't love me. Okay, I didn't love you. I get it. I got it. I understand it. Forgive me for it. But I'm better now than I was before. And if you keep holding that against me, you'll never move any further than I have moved. So I'm not going to parent you out of guilt. I'm not going to give in because of guilt. I'm going to say to you, <coughs> when they say, you were a bad parent. Sure was. You really messed me up. I know I did. <laughs> Well, you act like you don't care. I do care, but I can't do anything about it now, can I? Except try to do better now. And if you want to live back there, live back there. I can't live anywhere else. Their perspective may lead to healing for both the offended and the offender, while a selfish look often results in gossip, spreading bitterness to others. That's how we know we have not yet yielded, <coughs> because it's still in our mouths to speak to people. I don't want to say anything, but I'm so Tammy hurt my feelings. <laughs> now, it's just between you and I. But sometimes she can just not be nice. <laughs> so I know that I have carried that offense because I am now spreading it. If I had dropped it, 
There's no need to tell anyone. We tell it because we want to tell it. <coughs> and we want someone to justify why we're feeling that way. Well, what did she say? Oh, she shouldn't have said it. Mm, mm -mm. Well, you know, she did that to me last year. <laughs> because, you know, we always go to the person that has already had an altercation with someone. You're not going to go to Mr. Tammy's best friend and say, Mr. Tammy, you're going to be like, because they're going to be like, well, you probably deserve to be hurt. <laughs> as long as I know Mr. Tammy, I don't know. Well, I'm not coming to you no more. I've got to look for an enemy. That's how you know. If you're gossiping and spreading bitterness, <coughs> you're still offended. And you have a root. You need to get rid of it. Let's look at Ephesians 4. I'm almost done, Sharon. <laughs> Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 says, let no what? Harmful language come from your mouth. Only good words that are helpful in meeting the need. Words that will benefit those who hear them. Come on, people. That's a refrigerator moment right there. Because that is so far away from what we do. <coughs> no harmful language. And if you don't know what harmful language is, <laughs> you just listen to yourself, you'll get it. <laughs> Look at that. Good, only good words that are helpful. Don't cause grief to God's Ruach HaKadash, for he has stamped you as his property until the day of final redemption. Do you get that connection? Your home for words, even though it hurts someone else, contaminates someone else, <coughs> even though your words will not be helpful, who are actually you grieving? And then what does he tell us? So get rid of what? All bitterness, rage, anger, violent assertiveness, and slander, along with all spitefulness, because jump back up to 20. Uh, nine. That's coming through your harmful language, and you have that harmful language, and you're not using good words because of verse 31, and you need to be doing verse 32. We find this link to the tongue. That word slander actually in the Greek is blasphemy. Let that be a little stronger to you. <coughs> so you are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit with bitterness and those sins which stand in the way of forgiveness. Because you're bypassing how you're supposed to be. So you're actually telling him he doesn't know better than you and that he needs to come and get revenge, and he needs to come and punish, and he needs to come and have justice. Because if you love me, Daddy, if you love me, <coughs> this would not be happening. If you love me, you start changing some things, and he doesn't parent us out of guilt. Bitterness affects not only the offended person and the offender, but guess who else? Because the person who harbors bitterness may well be himself a root of bitterness, which means your poisonous fruit is growing within the community. It's one thing if you yourself contained your own bitterness, but you don't. It will spread like wildfire. And so harmful is the root of bitterness within a community <coughs> that look what Yehovah labels it, an abomination. Look at Proverbs again. There are six things Jehovah what? Hates. Seven which he detests. Can you get any stronger than that? And what are they? A haunted look. A lion tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that plots wicked schemes. Feet swift in running to do evil. A false what? <coughs> Witness who lies with every breath. And what's the last one? Him who sows strife among the brothers. So let's look at it. There are six things. One, two, three, four, five, six that he hates. The seventh one is an abomination. And what is that? Sow in discord. That's the seventh one. Takes on a little bit greater weight. Well, I don't know. I would think a lion tongue or a hand that shed innocent blood. No. Him who sows discord. It's an abomination. 
<coughs> spreading strife among brothers is the constant effect of a root of bitterness. It will contaminate many. See, if you shed innocent blood, who to kill? I know it affects everyone, but who, one. Right? <coughs> and you have to deal with that. And, of course, if you're in this community and you killed one, we all have to deal with it. But it affects one person. A heart that plots wicked schemes <coughs> can affect whoever. But who sows strife among the brothers creates roots of bitterness that can be seen for years and years. And who, as a parent, do you greatly affect more with your root of bitterness? Your children, who you have now sown that seed also. So rather than forgiving and experiencing the, peop- uh, the, <coughs> the, the peace that comes from humble submission to Jehovah's ways, a root of bitterness so seeds of division and discord. We have to, we have to find that root and get that, get that out. So if Minister Tammy said something smart to me, you know what I need to do with her? I need to open up my arms and run to her and say, I love you. And not even pick up that offense. And if she shuns me and turns away, <coughs> I still will love her. If I see her in a hallway, I'll still wave at her. See her in Walmart, I'll still go up to her because I'm sowing seeds of relationship until God deals with her about the other, right? But we are an eye for an eye. You don't talk to me, I won't talk to you. You won't see me, I won't see you. You don't call me, I won't call you. <coughs> you, you walked away when I was down aisle nine. I'll find you in aisle 15. I'll walk away too. <laughs> Just so you know that I know that you know, Right? So let me wrap this up by asking, what is the remedy for bitterness? It's very simple. Repentance. What's Hebrews 12, 17 say? For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing, he was what? Rejected. Indeed, even though he saw it with tears, his change of heart was to no avail. (coughs) When I was reading that, because it doesn't sound like it seems right, it sounds like that he's trying to be repentive, but at the same time, then God's not receiving it. So it kind of sounds like, you know, but we also know that God knows the heart and we don't. So here we find that in Hebrews chapter 12, 17, that Esau recognized that repentance was necessary. And though he sought it in the natural with tears, it was never to be his possession because he couldn't have a change of heart. We all sit here saying, I know I'm supposed to forgive, right? <coughs> I know I'm supposed to forgive. I know I'm supposed to forgive. If you had counseling with you, I know, Pastor, I know what I'm supposed to say. I know I'm supposed to forgive. I know I'm not supposed to do that. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And then you will also cry, I know, I know, I know, I know. But that doesn't change you, right? What does this truth tell us? And I want you to get this. Because if, if the Ruach talks to you, if the Ruach is, is pricking your heart, I want you to understand the truth of, of Hebrews chapter 12 as I close this up. We'll find the truth in Acts 5.31. We'll find the truth in, in 2 Timothy 2.25. <coughs> what does it tell us? It tells us that repentance is a gift from Yehoah, not necessarily the automatic possession of any who seek it. How did you come to know him? Because he called you. You would not find him unless he let himself be found. Remember from the very beginning of time, he went to the end of time and he saw you and he called you and he set his love on you. That means you can't love him unless he loves you. That means <coughs> you cannot have for repentance unless he moves upon you to repent. You don't have it in you. You, you, you are evil, and evil inclination. You're sinful. You don't want to repent. You want justice. You want getting even. You don't have the ability to repent. Only you can repent when he moves on you to repent. So it's very understandable that when the Holy Spirit comes and speaks to you, it means he's giving you a gift. Don't push it away. It's a gift. 
In Africa, we talked about intimate relationship leads to intimate communion. I preached that sermon here. <coughs> it might sound unfamiliar to you if you can't remember. I talked about intimate relationship creates intimate communion, and intimate communion then creates intimate privilege. And you can't have privilege with God. Asking anything, and it shall be done without communion. And you can't have communion without relationship. And a lot of times our prayers are not answered because we don't have intimate privilege and we don't have intimate privilege because we don't have communion and we don't have communion because we don't have relationship. Do we have a do we come to church? Yes. Do we read the Bible? Yes. Do we do we seek him sometimes with our tears? Yes. But we have to understand these are gifts that God has given to us. So when he says come as a holy convocation, that's the gift. I'm coming. When he says I, I want you to repent, that's the gift. Repent. It's not something that you're choosing. It's something he gives you. If he doesn't want to forgive you, he won't. So you sit here, if any of you have sat here and you know that you've done something wrong and you felt the prick of God, you know he loves you and that's a gift. Repent quickly. Receive the gift and repent because the more you acknowledge and, and refuse that, that, that gift, the harder it is to open that gift up. <clears throat> but I can't forgive. That's right. You can't. That's why it's a gift. You're not telling anything un, uh, untruthful. You yourself, without the Ruach HaKadosh, will hate everyone. Because someone will do something to you sometime. Come on, people. There's no way church can exist without the Ruach HaKadosh. It would no longer be Line of Judah Ministries. It would be Line of Judah WWF. We cannot exist without the prick of the Spirit of God <coughs> that are given us gifts, gifts of grace, gifts of mercy, gifts of repentance. They are gifts. You don't have the ability. You know people who have no ability to repent. I'll show it to you. Let's, Acts 5.31. God has exalted this man at his right hand. Who? Yeshua as what? Ruler and Savior. In order to what? I, I didn't hear you. In order to what? Enable Israel to do what? Teshuvah, repentance, and have her sins forgiven. Only Yeshua can enable them to repent. So you go there, and you're trying to get them to repent. Don't you know you're wrong? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? <clears throat> you're going through the scripture. I'm not saying you don't say it. I'm not saying that you don't tell them. But what I'm saying is the moment they repent, it's because God has given them the gift. And until God gives them the gift, they will continue to be a hellion on their way to hell. And you cannot manipulate God to bring that gift to them because it's in God's way and God's timing. And if the promise is the promise, then he will do it, but he won't do it in you. He's not going to parent you out of guilt. So you weren't a good parent all the time. Okay, who is? You aren't a good husband or a good wife all the time. Okay, who is? You're not a good brother and sister to everyone in this place. Okay, who is? That's why we need him. And if you're putting that demand on someone that you yourself cannot give, that's hypocritical. Do we try to be the best? Yes. Do we always succeed? No. But when we hear him prick us, we repent. And if we don't, we push him aside. And that voice gets softer and softer and softer and farther and farther away. And the root gets longer and longer and longer. It's a gift. It's not a drudgery to forgive and to be have repentance. It's a gift he has given to us. <coughs> Second Timothy 2.25. Also, he should be uh, gentle as he corrects his opponents. For God may perhaps grant them the opportunity to turn from their sin. He might grant them the opportunity. Which means who has the the power to grant them repentance and to and to bring them to a place where he does. You don't. Have you ever just banged your head on a wall trying to get someone to do something, repent? You went from don't you want a home in heaven to hell is hot and it's going to be bad. Wouldn't you rather break and be in the ar loving arms of God or you want to break hell wide open? Which one do you want? Then we pray, God, hear my prayer. God's like. God, if you love me, if you. I love you, but you're not manipulating me. 
You know why? Because you have your own best interest, and I have the other person's best interest, <coughs> which means I could bring him in or I can bring her in now, and yet then a month or two months ago they might wander away because it wasn't true, it wasn't right. Or we can let them get rid of some things and die to some things and lose some things that when they finally come back in, it will be in. What do you want? You want to be back here in a month or back here in a year? Or would you rather let me do it? Can get your hands off. And when you hear me tell you to repent, when I, you hear me tell you to get rid of that root of bitterness, <coughs> do it because that's a gift I'm giving you. It's nothing you can do on your own. And he should be gentle as he corrects his opponents, for God may perhaps grant them the opportunity to turn from their sins, acquire full knowledge of the truth, which means you can't get it on your own unless he enables you to do it. You can't love him unless he wants you to love him. You're not called unless he's called you. You didn't write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and say, here it is. Got to make sure my name is spelled right. He writes your name. You know the difference? Because sometimes when you write your own name, you make mistakes. If he writes your name, he's never made a mistake, which means if he wrote your name, he'll make sure it's, it's all coming to pass. If Jehovah grants repentance, then it's a gift of unspeakable worth. I don't think we look at it as a, as a great gift of worth. I like this sermon because we're coming up on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, <coughs> and Sukkot, which has to do with it. it. We're supposed to be looking at ourselves and cleansing ourselves. And, and what greater moment before Rosh Hashanah uh, when he returns, that he returns with the people who are watered and not dry. And I'm not asking you to run around saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, because sometimes that people have done things that you don't even, they don't even know they did it. And now they're like, what? I did what? And some of you are creating more of a, uh, uh, of a, <coughs> uh, a scenario than you want. I'm talking about here. Come to here. Let God prick your heart and repent. If, it doesn't matter. If, if something has happened, they'll come to you. But, it, I mean, now, if it's obvious, you might need to go and hug them and say, forgive me. But, you know, sometimes I find that people have been hurt by people who don't even know they hurt them. We carry things that people don't even know anything about, and we still want them to be punished and get even when they don't even know what they did. Pastor, you know you were smart with me. When? Apparently it wasn't, uh, you don't care enough about me to remember, but in 2009, when you first You've been carrying it that long? Oh, my land. I wonder how many times the gift of repentance came to you. The gift to forgive came to you, and you pushed it aside. <coughs> the unspeakable worth, repentance, frees us from bitterness and allows us to then extend the same mercy that Messiah had to us. Don't we need to be like him? There's not many of us that could eat at a table year after year with a man who's going to betray him without some sort of give him the last of the sh lamb. Sorry, Judas, there's no more Jews. Right? In forgiveness... I'm going to put these up because you need to, if you can write them down quickly, you need to write them down. In forgiveness, we emulate Yahuwah. In bitterness, we follow in the footsteps of Esau. I want to emulate him. I don't want to be like Esau. In forgiveness, we emulate Yahuwah. In bitterness, we follow in the footsteps of Esau. In mercy, we act like Yeshua. <coughs> in hatred, we give way to the devil. We need to act like him. Mercy doesn't mean you're overlooking. Mercy means I'm giving you what I can give you. Yehovah has to do the rest. I'm not the judge. I cannot be the one who gets even. I am not the punisher. My job is to show mercy. 
to extend my hand of love. Does it mean relationship is restored? Not always. <coughs> Does it mean your best path? Not always. Right? Listen, you might have had some altercations here. Doesn't mean that you're every service you're sitting beside them. It just means you can still church with them. You can still stretch your hand in mercy with them. You can still love them. You can still hug them. You can still hallelujah, Shabbat Shalom. Without going Shabbat <laughs> Shalom. We're not asking you to <coughs> feed each other at the Oneg so that you have some sort of, no, okay. What do you do as a mature person? You go on. You show mercy. You still love. Are you best buds? Maybe not. Maybe later, maybe. Ephesians 4, 25 and 27. I'm almost finished. Really, I am. I'm not lying to you this time. Therefore, stripping off falsehood, let everyone speak truth with his neighbor because we are intimately related to each other as parts of the body. What are we? Intimately related as parts of the body. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with the cause of your anger. What's he recognizing? You will be angry. You are flesh and <laughs> blood. Someone's going to tick you off. But the difference between someone ticking you off or being angry and whether you're mature or not mature is that before the sun goes down, <coughs> you will have dealt with it. You will have been pricked by releasing that offense. You will have exhibited forgiveness, and it will not change your day nor a root be planted. Otherwise, you leave room for the adversary. What do we need to be doing the last day? Making sure there's no room for the adversary. How do you do that? By filling your house up with Yehovah. May Yehovah grant each of us a heart of teshuva. As we move into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, may he grant unto us a heart of returning of repentance, that we might forgive others as he has forgiven us. Let's stand and read, <coughs> and you can know it by heart, I am sure, but we'll read it because sometimes we do debtors and sometimes we do those who have trespassed. Let's read this together. You, therefore, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us the food we need today and forgive us what we have done wrong as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one for kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. Close your eyes. <coughs> Search your heart. Look at your tree. Any bitterness? Any root? any anger, any rage, any violent assertiveness, anything that's going to hinder you, stop you. Do you want justice? Do you want to get even? Do you, do you want God to punish? We're going into a new year, a new <coughs> chronological year, not a spiritual year, but a new natural year. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Understand that repentance is a gift. Forgiveness is a gift. Let not your heart be hardened by the root of that bitterness. Now is the time just to ask God, God. Because he might be revealing some things to you, and if he's revealing a name or a person or a situation, that's your gift. That's your gift. Father, forgive me. Father, I repent. Father, I lay this offense down. Father, I change my unforgiveness to forgiveness. <coughs> Call it, name it, put a face.
face to it, put a name to it, put a situation or a circumstance to it, because if it's being brought to you, it's a gift. And he loves you so much that he wants you to be free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, you see our hearts. You know our hearts. We love you. We gather ourselves together to worship you. We acknowledge that sometimes we want you to parent out of guilt of our lives and what we've been through and what we've experienced. <clears throat> but we know that you do not do that. So, Father, help us be like you. Help us seek you. Search for you. Act like you. Be like you. Let us be quick to forgive and quick to lay down the offense. Free us from this root of bitterness that has been running underneath the ground that we might not be poisonous fruit or exhibit poisonous fruit. And I just want you to lift your hands and worship him. Because once you've repented and once you've asking, thank him for the gift. Worship him for who he is. We love you, Lord. Change my heart, oh God. Let that be our song to him. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Come on, sing that to him. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what
Children, come on. church. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we come before you thanking you for each child that's represented underneath this shawl, every child that's here, every child that's not. We ask, God, that you will reach down, touch them, bring them to the saving knowledge of you as Messiah if they do not know you. If they know you, fill them with the Ruach HaKadosh. Father, let them walk in your ways, talk your ways, run the path that is set before them, the race that is set before them. We ask, God, that you will protect them. Lord, let them see every snare of the fowler in their path. Father, let their voice be a voice of reasoning, a voice of power, and a voice of authority in a generation that needs you more than ever. Use them, Father, for your kingdom and for your glory. <coughs> Watch over them. Keep them safe. Father, let them always run after you, run for you. We give you praise, Lord, as you touch them and use them, their gifts, their abilities, their talents. Whether like a Sarah or a Rachel or Rebecca, Father, or uh, Ephraim, or Manasseh, or Joseph, or Esther. Use them with the gifts and talents you've given to them as we lift them up before you. Bless them in Yeshua's name. Amen. Lift up your hands before Yehovah to receive the priestly blessing. Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. Yehovah, he who exists, will eliminate the onus of his being towards you, bringing order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up onus of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be, whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you in the fellowship.